thanks all for for attending today. Um, my name is Steve Spiker. I'm going to be presenting to you today an update about what's going on in W3C and the Link Data Platform and OSLC and, and some uh, ongoing activity and some future specification work. Uh, for those, uh, as far as logistics of the call, um, you can hit star six to mute, mute yourself. If we get too much noise, we'll end up uh, muting everyone, so you'd be star six again to come off mute. There is a chat um, available in the, the meeting, online meeting, so you can post questions there. I'm not actively watching that, but uh, Sean Kennedy will be, and I will try to uh, pause and leave some time at the end for any questions at that point. So let's go ahead and get started. As I mentioned, we're going to talk about a little bit of the background of, of what we're doing with Link Data and Link Data Platform and OSLC, uh, what's motivated some of the thinking, go into a little bit of what is it, the, the aspects of it, and why it's interesting. Look at the activity around standardization and uh, a thing that I have worked on for a number of years now on open services for lifecycle collaboration that's uh, motivated by the principles of linked data. So I work within uh, IBM's uh, rational uh, brand that works on uh, within the software division, uh, which deals with software development and systems and software development tooling. And if you look at uh, the history of tools, and the date range is, is kind of picked randomly, but um, we, we, you could massage it either way. But if you were to look at the, how tools have evolved starting, say, mid-90s uh, or year 2000, there was a number of best-of-breed tools that you would use around software configuration management, test management, test case management, uh, test automation, around defect tracking, work item tracking, et cetera, um, the typical user complaints were, um, you know, those those point products, those those individual tools that are focused on certain uh, roles or disciplines need, need to work better at the job I'm doing. And then, oh, by the way, it would be nice if, uh, if I needed to talk to another system and th that would work in some cases. So in year 2005, roughly, you're saying um, this concept of, of application lifecycle management, where we said, well, that we really look at these things coming together to build a, a, a solution around this application or project or piece of software or product that's being built. Uh, but we will provide something that will help um, manage this lifecycle by start to take these things and glue them together using whatever is available, APIs from these tools, whether really published or private. Uh, the, the problem that uh, most developers had, or those who actually, the end users of these uh, integrations and tools was actually quite clumsy integrations, often required you to install many updates onto your, your physical machine to get it to work and have authentication work uh, set up properly between all of them. Um, but we're limited by the choice that was available because of what the integrations were there. So we really wanted the best of breed in the different domains. Um, and there's a number of management uh, complaints that you would have. It would be hard to really keep track and trace things across these tools, some metrics and reporting. And, and the reality was there's a mixed tool environment, as, especially as uh, companies get bigger and, and more diverse. Uh, there's a lot of open source uh, tools available with various uh, do-it-yourself integrations and uh, some add-on third-party integration ALM suites. So then looking a few years ago at, I'm starting to get a little bit of an echo, so I wonder if you could please go on star six or mute on your in your phone. Thank you. So one of the things we see as a major breakthrough of what we've been doing to integrate our tools together and working with partners and, and customers and their tools was to leverage the concepts of linked data and using OSLC as a model at uh, open-service.net was the, the site where we collaborate on the specifications around tool integration. The, the intent there is to le leverage and, and learn to, to integrate with open protocols in format definitions instead of some glue. 
And you see across various industries, there's a, uh, we all know there's a bunch of data silos. There's a need. Um, just picking some other uh, case that's not uh, software development tools, but looking at healthcare and life sciences is uh, the reporting and tracking and usage of, uh, of of various pharmaceutical drug trial and and as a result reporting adverse effects from either the the trial drugs or even the um, approved. Um, medications as well. Uh, as you can imagine, um, the various uh, producers require or have different systems by which to report. Uh, different government agencies have different ways of reporting information into it. Uh, there's, it's up to the, often the, the, the person or the facility providing um, the, the health care or the the treatment to the patient to kind of juggle all these things of reporting to um, the you know the appropriate government authorities, regulatory agencies, uh, to the pharmaceutical companies on the the issues with the drugs or um, other regulatory agencies on on a combination of things that that might be there. So it's a compounded problem. So it would be much better for this to have a common way to. Uh, work across, um, and I should have drawn lines even between the drug producer and the government uh, regulatory agency, it is a common protocol how this um, data is transferred, custom formats, uh, you know, what's the shape of that data, what, um, what should you expect, and, and also um, uh, need for, for some, some type of uh, uh, security model for that to work, a, a common uh, model to to be able to to work across these different groups. But with that, you can you can do some interesting things. Then now, not just reporting the information, um, you also can use um, benefit uh, from your your care by receiving updates uh, up to the second or real time as it's being reported. And now, learning from the the various reported adverse effects or different symptoms you can expect. And see from this treatment. So there's a, there's a lot of ways that can places and, and use cases um, that can uh, benefit from the usage of, of linking data and opening up data across different systems. So uh, the link data, the two words by itself, is is a pretty uh, simple uh, term. But what do we really mean by it? Um, let's go back to see what actually uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee uh, means by it. And he came up with these uh, design principles or these uh, these four key principles of linked data, um, which are a good motivation for for the work that we have and, and it has supplied um, a good basis for a lot of interesting use cases and applications. And the first is just use your eyes as names for things. So if you have to come up with a naming system, don't invent one. Just use your eyes. They're there. They're, they work. They're standards based. To use HTTP based your eyes, so that people um, can look up those names. And then by people, uh, we can also replace in there with computers too, um, and people using those computers, of course. Uh, three is when you look up the, that information over the URI, um, provide um, some useful information using some type of standard. So there's some standards that are available to produce um, some rich description in a standard format, which which is RDF, or resource description format, um, mechanisms to, to query over it, which is Sparkle. And the fourth item is, is once you get that information, uh, make sure that your information, as, as it has links to other things, are also your HTTP URI, so you can go follow those links and learn more things. So you can see it's an extremely uh, simple concept. Uh, and Tim concludes with this and just saying it's simple because it, it is. Uh, so what is it? Um, so you can think of data, uh, there's various statements you learn about things. So I'll use my software development uh, motivated uh, use case here where um, I may be a tester, I may know something uh, that I've tested, this test case 14. And I can't make progress on it because it's blocked by some uh, issue 973. And, and I might have this uh, knowledge because um, I went and searched it. I might have it because uh, somebody put it in a spreadsheet and I saw it, but it's just a, a simple statement or it's you know written on, on a web page somewhere. 
And some uh, independent knowledge would be, you know, maybe there's another statement or a fact that uh, there's a person, Joe, out there, and he works uh, as a committer on the Apache project. And this is, again, it, without um, some concepts of, of accessing this information on the Internet, you know, I could have learned this by, you know, talking at the water cooler. Uh, maybe Joe's my brother-in-law. You know, there's, there's all kinds of ways. But how can um, we take this statement and these, this information and construct it in a way uh, that is useful for uh, and easy for us to build additional statements and for the computer to understand. So we group them in a, a set of, uh, of three URIs to define some statement. Uh, so now we have a way that the computer clearly can understand um, that test case 14 is blocked by issue 973 and what each one of those things mean. Uh, likewise with uh, the second statement, uh, knowing that Joe is a uh, committer on the Apache project. So the real value of linked data comes in is um, the one is from those simple statements, but the fact they're HTTP URIs, I can now do a get, let's say let's do a get on issue 973 because I want to learn. It is blocking me, so I want to learn what's going on with it. So I fetch that information, and I can see, um, well, maybe my problems are worse than what I thought they were because I see it depends on um, some bug in another system. But the nice thing is I have these things linked together. Um, they're managed on three different servers, uh, different authorities that are on them, but I can access and, and navigate across these relationships across different systems. And in fact, I can see in that even issue where it works out that, um, you know, if I didn't have this prior knowledge, I could still know who Joe was and know he worked on Apache and can see um, you know, he's a contributor on, on this on this issue and therefore um, you know, follow that to see he's um, a member of the, the uh, Apache com committee uh, uh, committer in the community and can use that information. So a very simple, um, powerful way of, of being able to access the information. And it gives us uh, interesting ways that we can then start to build uh, simple graphs of uh, visualizations of the data to easily understand the relationship and impacts of key data, such as, in my case, issue 973. So that's that's a very narrow picture of, of linked data in the software development world. Um, so if you look what's going on in the, in the world, one uh, snapshot of it is this linked open data cloud, uh, which this is uh, represents a snapshot from uh, 2011. And this is showing as all the bubbles are different vocabularies from different sources. Um, and the data sets from those vocabularies drive this picture. And the size of the bubble means the number of uh, statements from that data source. And the size and the number of arrows is based on the uh, uh, number of relationships between them. And this shows that if you apply that same principle at a bit much larger scale, you know, global or intergalactic scale, um, you can really start building some very powerful graphs and relationships across this data. So that was a brief introduction uh, on uh, linked data and what we mean by it. So let's talk a bit about standardization. So um, maybe I'll, uh, hopefully I won't offend anyone by saying if some things are broken in areas that they're not, but I think we can all agree that areas can be improved on. So. If we look at the state of the art, uh, linked data has been focused a lot on exposing data with relationships. So uh, that it's been very limited in the, in the idea of it as sort of an application integration model as way for supporting the update or creation of finer grain data across different sources. I mean, there's been uh, definitely work done in that area, but it's, it's somewhat limited. Typically, the way you get your data updated is uh, you receive data set dumps from places or fetch a large set. Uh, there's the way to, if you're a client of the data consumer, um, you, you often have to go contact or go by another means to, to request that data to be updated. So it's not a direct uh, client back inter interaction, uh, maybe through some special um, polished APIs that that uh, data source puts out. And from that, as you expect, it's typically a, an export transformation of the data. So data stored in some other format and goes through some level of transformation prior to exposing it. Um, 
so that, and there's also a lot of good uh, um, publications and, and patterns, anti-patterns, best practices out there. But those are often focused on certain specialized usages. Uh, in some cases, they conflict a bit depending on what your use cases are. Um, so, as I said, they, the, the, what's been done is provides great value for many use cases, as shown. Um, we can find we can do better with some interoperable solutions based on some a bit more on a level of standardization. Um, and without the standardization, it often requires applications to try to support um, a mixture of these uh, best practices and also to um, you know, focus sort of on a least common denominator on some technology stacks as, as there's been some interoperability uh, issues with it. So start of standardization, further standardization around linked data, um, we motivated by the four design principles that uh, we already mentioned. Uh, they, there was a workshop sponsored in, uh, exactly a year ago um, uh, titled Linked Enterprise Data Patterns. And the point of a W3C workshop is to get a, a number of community members together, talk about a problem, and see what the right way forward is. Um, we had a lot of good participation uh, from members from Oracle, Nokia, EMC, um, et cetera. And then everyone presented their their pain points, uh, interest um, with it. And an outcome of the workshop was the recommendation from the work workshop participants that there should be some uh, work group charter to uh, define and specify some type of standard around a linked data platform. Uh, in order to help that uh, effort along, uh, IBM worked with a number of others, uh, co-submitters, and defined a starting point of specification and supporting use cases. Uh, we titled it the linked data based profile, as we're just looking at is it supporting some simple uh, uh, model um, and you know, not cover the full range of what the charter was being uh, proposed at, but that was submitted uh, and published in uh, March, April uh, this year. The linked data platform work group uh, started up in the beginning of the summer, and uh, later on, when they were looking at starting the specification work, had uh, agreed to start with that uh, basic profile for its its work. So, a bit more about the the link data platform working group. Uh, put a link in here. It's easily findable on the W3C site. Uh, I think the numbers I have here are low. There's uh, at least 45 participants from 27 organizations. Uh, there's two chairs. There's Arno Leor from IBM and Eric Wild from uh, EMC. Um, as it was mentioned, is working on a, defining a, a clear definition on linked data for interoperability of certain use cases. The charter uh, is to produce this linked data platform and is based on an HTTP application integration pattern for read-write linked data. The intent is to complement Sparkle, and the reason it says complement is uh, meaning that the thing should be done such that a Sparkle endpoint or Sparkle-enabled server would would easily be able to, to implement this, but uh, should not or maybe not require Sparkle as part of the specification itself. The the progress so far in the work group is uh, we've uh, published a first public working draft back on the 25th of October. Uh, with that, it has uh, not just the member submission, um, but uh, a number of issues were resolved and changed within that document, and some ongoing um, uh, uh, work had been done and, and reflected in the latest editor's draft. And uh, last, then the use case requirements document, which has been ongoing evolution and as a wiki form, is is now uh, being uh, polished for um, W3C publication. So there's an editor's draft available. It's uh, is linked to off of the workgroup page. Uh, this is, this is uh, recently um, just con converted to the. Um, 
the format and requirements for publication there, so uh, very new. And the work group's on target to deliver the a candidate recommendation in 2013. Uh, the the roadmap is published on the in the charter for the work group. And I'll go through and talk about some of the issues a bit more when I go through in a little bit more of the, the details of the specification and concepts um, that exist. The, the two main concepts within the linked data uh, platform are a uh, concept of a resource and then a container. Um, by resource, um, this is intended to mean that there's different kinds of resources in the world. Uh, the, the, and then in the, in the sense of the web as well. And this resource is really intended to describe um, the type of resource that can describe its state uh, fully within an RDF model. So realizing there's other valuable resources in the world, like a, a PowerPoint a document, a um, uh, you know a picture, uh, a you know, JPEG, et cetera. Um, those, those are, you know, in, in the, the spec will work to, to talk about the relationship of those, but there's some things such as that can be modeled um, in this type of information resource, such as uh, a requirement, a, uh, a financial asset, et cetera. So there's certain questions we'll look to answer here talking about this, this type of resource. Uh, you know, one of the first ones that come up is we want to depend on some type of resource format which should be used. And the work group has, uh, has agreed on that the uh, turtle format is the, the one that should go forward with. Uh, what literal value types should be used? Um, what are their typical vocabularies that should be uh, reused or used or, or what things are missing that are needed? Uh, how should you handle some optimi optimistic collision detection? for updating resources, uh, seeing when things change from, from underneath you and not wipe out any, any unexpected changes there. Uh, some expectations for clients as we see that um, there's the ensuring a loose coupling and, and not depending on the link to resource being of some concrete type that never changes. And then what can uh, servers do to, to not make things so complicated that clients can never actually create resources, so being sure that there's some guidance put in place there. So one of the simple examples here is just looking at a, um, a cash asset type of resource. So we do a get on a on some um, member one resource stored in some server, I'll give it the, the authority host name of example.org. The, the request text turtle it comes back in the turtle format here, which is uh, the resource identified by example.org slash container one slash member one. And it's a it's of type cache, so we want to make sure that um, resources have some type identified with them to make it easier on uh, queries, so doing simple queries across different types of resources, and just some simple statements about it, like giving it a standard title uh, or label associated with it. A um, couple disclaimers or words of warning when reading these things. Uh, these URLs are it's intended to be opaque, and so the structure of these are would kind of follow what you would see an application to typically do, but uh, the spec doesn't mandate anything at this current state. So that was a real simple look at a, a, an RDF-based uh, resource there. So let's talk about the linked data platform container. So one of the, um, the key key elements is this, this container concept. So we find a common pattern for doing things is knowing what URL to use when I want to create or post the, the representation of a resource uh, to some, some URI. But when I post it there, I have some expectation that when I do a git on that same URI, I will find that thing I just created so or the things that were created before me. So I'll be able to find a list of those existing resources. And a common thing that comes up is how do I uh, understand the ordering of the entries of that, the, the members of that container? Um, how can I efficiently get the, the information about the members of the resources when I'm getting the container itself? Um, since a lot of these containers, a uh, common pattern we've seen is that 
some containers can be the memberships can be quite large, and so uh, well, how's a good way to break this up into chunks or into pages that? Uh, can easily be uh, navigated by a client, and the client requests it, and ensure that the, the data itself is easy to query. And I think I've talked about that a little bit already. So let's look at an example. This is probably a simple, one of the simplest examples. So you have, you know, again, you're doing a get on a on container one. You're looking to um, get the a, a turtle text turtle representation of it. Comes back with a uh, simple statement, uh, a set of statements where the subject is the uh, container one. You can see there's a type here called LDP container, which is saying that's that's what the type of resource this is. Um, it has a title as well, and then we're using uh, a known uh, predicate here as one of the best practices. Is so we're saying that there's a number of members here, uh, one, two, three. So very very simple. Uh, containers and, and, and HTTP interaction to fetch the the description of and representation of that container. So how do I add things to this container? So simply, I just take that URI for the container um, container one. I post to it. Uh, I have here a, a a different kind of resource and, and a subclass type of sent of a stock is maybe a a number of financial assets that we're we're adding to this container, and a uh, simple definition of it and, and uh, the value, so some data with it. But to the server then, um, in this case, to assign it a new name, it calls it member four, and returns a simple 201 created in the, the new URI for that thing. And so just re reissuing the get just to see, yep, the, the fourth thing is there, as, as I expected. So let's look at a more complicated model. Following on the theme of, of net worth and, and financial assets, um, drawing a simple uh, class diagram here showing a net worth, having some description associated with it, being linked to some person, the owner of that, it having a number of assets associated with it, and those type of assets are stock, bond, and cash. And of course, associated with each asset is a value. So looking just at the response of a get on this, we can see that the, uh, in the red middle item here is net worth, or net worth uh, NW1 is the um, end of the URI that describes this resource. The type of net worth that we've seen before, and it has a slightly different um, shape to this uh, this turtle document here in the RDF, is that uh, the asset has uh, property, has uh, multiple objects, uh, so sort of like a multi-valued property. So there's uh, A1 and A2. Um, so the question then, if you looked at that on its own, you would sort of say, well, there's no real container there. The predicate itself is defined in the vocabulary. Uh, so we associate with it some container where we can add assets. Um, so you see the, the definition of the um, asset container below, defined as an LDP container, uh, has a couple extra uh, statements at the end saying that the, it is describing and is associated with the membership membership subject of the uh, net worth NW1 resource above, and that is associated with the membership predicate uh, asset. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, then, so the, this doesn't have the example of the RDFS member, it's using the, the as, O colon asset uh, predicate, um, an example of the subject for the container being something different than the resource. So one other aspect to mention was, well, how can we get uh, efficiently get information about the container, the resource, and the member uh, resources at the same time? So uh, simple, you can, uh, within the, the actual response, you can just include additional statements about those assets or those resources. So A1, you see it's a stock and its value is 10,000, and A2, you see it's a bond and its value is 20,000, so uh, a way that um, a uh, uh, server can provide back an efficient response to a client with additional information that is sees fit. 
So in some cases, you'll say, well, there's uh, maybe a lot of data associated um, with a container, and I'm really interested in the information about the non-member properties. And so uh, and this is a case where um, we do identify you know, some, some additional um, token that you supply on the request URI, the question mark uh, non-member properties, and then on the response, the, the member information is omitted. So this allows clients to um, learn about the container without having to deal with all the data first. It might be just interested in adding uh, resources to a container and therefore not interested in the current um, a list of, of existing members. Additional case which mentioned as large, large data sets and, and paging. And again, this is how a client can initiate is by um, adding the, the token uh, first page on the end of the request URI of the container. Um, this then uh, will fetch the information as it did before about the net worth resource uh, NW1, uh, the URI trailing in NW1, and then the asset container is before, uh, no changes there. And then a new kind of resource here, an LDP one page, which is a um, describing the page resource, um, saying it's a page of the container itself, uh, gives you a URI to the next page. Uh, that, again, this is a, an example where the actual URIs here don't matter because uh, it's all uh, interpreted from the content here. So for example, the next page, uh, you could be uh, any value in there, and, and the client would just pull out that object uh, and use that URI to fetch the next page. Uh, the key here is that um, another key thing to mention is that these containers themselves are paged and not the whole HTTP response. And so uh, there's other mechanisms that exist in the web for how um, paging might work across uh, multiple responses. And to be clear that uh, the way to indicate the last page is not the omission of the next page, but the actual explicit definition of the next page being nil. And as you get pages, you would expect uh, some of that information be of interest or in a, in a sense of ordering. So there's a definition on the page that describes the container sort predicates or what um, what the response is ordered by. Uh, so in the case of we're not, um, one of the decisions we could have is taken and inserted a um, an ordinal uh, like index into the, the sum list. Uh, but realizing that oftentimes the data is already contains the sorted information so as part of the data model, we just need to express which one it's uh, ordered based on or sorted based on. And so that's what the container sort predicate does. From there, if you wanted to in insert your own sort index, you could do that and then list it within the container sort predicate. But the intent is to leverage the do domain model and just express uh, which part of that domain model is being used. So that was a quick pass through the standardization uh, efforts around a linked data platform and some of the core concepts that are part of it. Um, so I'll move on to talk about OSLC, or Open Services for Lifecycle Collaboration, and how it relates to some activity going on there. Hey, Steve. Sounds like someone has uh, put us on hold. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute all the lines. Okay. Star 6 to come off mute, and others who want to ask questions can do the same trick. All participants are now in listen-only mode. Okay, I'm back. Yes, you are. So if we look at a, a picture of tools within, um, uh, whether they be within a traditional sense of ALM or if they fall to a broader uh, definition of, of DevOps and, and on to service management task, you can see uh, you can leverage uh, linked data on its own by uh, simply uh, exposing, as it described, the resources using RDF and HTTP uh, and linking those between the different tools. Um, and OSLC to data has done uh, 
some work to leverage the, the concepts um, that have been evolved into LDP to, to help describe it. Um, so it contains an uh, amount of, of that information. But it also, uh, to get more value out of it, uh, we have these domains that come together and describe some key elements or some key um, terms for each one of these different domains. So we'll describe what a bug looks like or a change request. We'll describe what a requirement looks like, um, describe what, and define what the interesting uh, relationships are between those things uh, based on some key scenarios we see. So uh, just showing a real simple example here of a change request that implements this, some other requirement uh, resource. This other requirement, you know, following as the definitions were before, um, it then also can have a, a link out to some other place that it's uh, linking to a, a test case 17. Um, so these good uh, examples of defining some additional well-defined uh, uh, terms for use in these scenarios and with some key meaning in leveraging these core link data principles. We've also found the need, as we have with tool integration, there's a lot of user interface, especially in the web UI, um, various uh, user interfaces. and and Eclipse based and Visual Studio based uh, clients. So there's a way to request a resource preview. So some minimal amount of HTML that you can use to embed into your tool or to retreat as some type of rich hover. Uh, so we have some, some simple definitions there. Um, also finding things across the different tools is, also, is often a problem, but uh, well, all these tools also have the same similar concept of this pop-up dialog that allows me to to enter in some information, some domain, um, some implementation-specific or domain-specific items, and then figure out um, you know what what resource I'm really trying to get to, or even create. So the same model works there. And once when I'm in this embedded uh, dialog. Uh, and I click OK, I can send some, some message back that says, here's the URI for this thing uh, that the end user selected in this dialog and, and you know, update the model to include that link. So uh, in addition to providing uh, the base uh, link data concepts within OSLC, there's a number of add-ons like this that provide the resource definition, user interface, uh, go into query, uh, syntax over a simple uh, get URI and, and, and resource descriptions via shape. So there's a lot more to it. Uh, just a quick overview of some, some additions. Uh, so this uh, next slide, I'll talk about uh, a number of things uh, that are going on. Uh, so the, on the right is uh, a graphic that often use the progress that specifications are in. And you can see there's a number of the two specifications that are finalized, uh, asset management being the most recent one to enter uh, uh, in complete finalization. Automation 2.0 is um, reached the core approval and now going to steering committee for approval, uh, and that should be done very soon. Uh, a number of, of active groups uh, working towards uh, uh, their, their versions of, of specifications now, performance monitoring, reconciliation, configuration management, TLM, ALM, et cetera, and some non-spec groups that are going on. And there's there's also an uh, uh, amount of non-2.0, uh, let's say post-2.0, not non-2.0 work starting where um, looking at core change management, architecture management, and more uh, that are starting to look at the relationship um, and leveraging the, the linked data platform work or LDP, and I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, one other non-spec group that I can't squeeze so much on there is the steering committee, which was newly formed in 2012, um, uh, kicked off uh, back in June. Um, they've been uh, looking at a number of key topics. Uh, the, the composition um, you can learn about from, from the website at uh, open-services.net. Um, even most recently, uh, talking about how to increase the appeal and the adoption of and the the further independence of the specification work by uh, looking towards um, an, an OASIS member section for, for OSLC specification development. Um, so you'll see more um, news on that uh, coming forward in plan. Uh, and I believe there's a, a blog post um, that has been put out or 
somebody's about ready to hit submit on it that will have more detail on that as well. Yes, Steve, it is available, and I'll paste it into the chat for everyone. Okay, thanks. Um, so I mentioned some of the works already. There's uh, participation from a large number of groups. OSLC is not just limited to what's going on in open dash service that net specification development, but it's actually the concepts and some of the specs are being used across uh, a couple different initiatives. Um, there's a group within uh, in Japan region where uh, looking at how uh, it can share and define some project management data uh, through. Uh, sharing across multiple suppliers for, for project information there. Um, interoperability framework and CESAR around um, many of the product lifecycle management and tools and, and systems and, and so on. Um, one other key item is showing, you know, specifications are nice, but implementations would be even better. So we, we track what the community reports to us on a page, um, uh, oslc.co slash uh, software, and um, there's a number of growing tools out, a growing number of tools out there. Uh, you can learn more what's going on. Uh, also, to help that, there's a uh, Eclipse Leo 1.0 release uh, that just was announced, which has a number of um, has a reference implementation fairly complete for Bugzilla. And uh, some other sample ones, test suites, uh, an SDK to help uh, get started, and a lot of good activity there. And I think there's a number of contributors, uh, committers on this call today too. Um, so, taking in the, in the spirit of open source and implementation, I just wanted to highlight that across uh, linked data, there's uh, an OSLC. Um, there's a number of, of projects that are out there. Um, Eclipse Leo uh, specifically uses uh, Apache Wink and Apache Jenna uh, to build up um, an SDK for, for generating request and response based on, on OSLC specs. Um, Marmota is a new, um, just a, a announced and approved recently, looking to be an implementation of a uh, linked data platform as defined by the W3C workgroup. Uh, so that's new and uh, interesting and, the, and evolving. Uh, and I figured I'd just take one quick look at what, what does it mean to uh, support this and what can a tool like uh, Apache Wink and Apache Jenna and Eclipse Leo provide for you. And I've, I've sanitized this picture a little so it doesn't have a bunch of constant names in it. But it just simply defines, you know, this, is, this method is my get change request will produce a HTTP or respond to HTTP get responses and it will do it based on some change request ID, the CRID, and, and from and it will accept these type of um, and produce responses for these type of requests of RDF XML, XML, JSON, etc. So a real simple way of, of defining um, your HTTP interaction and complying with these various standards that exist. Um, so I'm checking my time, so I'm going to spend a, the, my end here on uh, OSLC version 3 topics, um, but in order to sometimes talk about what's next, you got to talk about what you currently have. So the version 2 spec structure follows a pattern where uh, there's this approved core 2.0, which has a number of capabilities and guidance and um, some of the other things are not specification necessarily, but maybe help you uh, define a specification. The domains, uh, domain specs, uh, essentially uh, point to it and say we depend on this core 2.0, and then refine the various capabilities by saying you know it's it, maybe it was a should then, it's a must in my spec. Um, maybe add a few additional protocol requirements on top of that, and define uh, what the resources are like the example we showed before with requirements and change requests. Um, so when you look at it, a domain is sort of treated as, you know, domain sort of absorbs the core and the thought of it was one big spec um, from sort of the, the end user of it. Uh, the nice thing about the domain specs is in the domain work groups, it's really a group of experts in that domain and so they're 
focusing the discussions and integrations based on their domain expertise and, and not in, in the abstract. And so the, those concrete cases um, uh, are kind of factored out and learned across the different domains, and those common capabilities are, are often uh, promoted into the core common set of uh, specs or capabilities. So from this, um, we got some good value out of it, but we just wanted to highlight well, what, what are the key, some of the issues we see with what we've done here. Um, we see that a lot of the domain specs um, are almost the same or the same or slightly different. And so from a client, it becomes a bit difficult, especially if they're looking to support multiple domains, then it has to learn you know, that what's special about this domain and how it it handles the different um, requirements on the core. Um, the other thing is, um, I don't know if it's, uh, it's an I I issue, but it's it's been, I guess it's an issue in the sense that the core's really can see, considered or thought of or originally conceived of as not something it would stand on its own. Uh, so it really needs a domain to make it real uh, in, in terms of a, object oriented sense, you can think of it as an abstract base class, so uh, you need that domain to make it real. But in the case, there are a number of cases we're finding where a uh, set of applications um, and, and domains are, are sort of domainless or kind of gray in what domain they are, and they can get a lot of value out of just what the core says and how it, and, and the specs that are there. So um, that's one aspect of it. And we also found that since we put everything in a one spec, the protocol plus the vocabularies, it's nice that you have one big document that, in a sense, it says, here's the spec, it's done, it's, it's approved. But as soon as you say, well, but I need to add this one extra uh, vocabulary term um, for the scenario, uh, and then you're like, well, do we, then do we need to go through the full spec process? It's really a, it doesn't impact anything. It's the way, um, RDF and the model was intended to evolve, so so the spec process didn't necessarily match what we were doing with the technology and the various components. Um, so that's some of the setup and motivation. So the key themes of version three, um, we want to further adoption. So we feel like the, of course, the the more people out there supporting it, the uh, the more value they'll get out of it, um, so more tools exposing their data, um, they'll be motivated then for clients to go consume it, and more con those clients to consume it, there'll be more to expose their data. So uh, sort of a traditional chicken and egg problem, but also a reality of, of adoption as key. And even in some spirit of that is simplification. So the simpler you can make things and align them with uh, some existing standardization, uh, that will help uh, reduce the, the barrier to adoption, even simplifying some of the, the technical concepts. And so we want to make that, sure that was a key theme in version three, and then also to take that key theme and, and, and move uh, the amount of specification we're doing at OSLC. I mean, we're still doing it because I'm you know personally involved, but doing it at, at uh, standards bodies where we can get uh, uh, a broader community and, and a bigger set of experts uh, in that area um, looking at this problem and building off of it. Uh, community growth, looking at beyond, um, uh, looking at different areas of, of, of where our specifications and concepts can be used, evolving beyond uh, what we've seen today. So uh, it's always been a, a, a model of of evolution and incremental specification, so uh, we don't wash our hands after 2.0 and say we've solved all the integration problems. We just claim that we've um, taken a, 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 an approach and a way to solve some of the use cases that we've, or solve the use cases that we've outlined uh, and what we've we we tried to do. And and there's ones that are in our backlog that we'd like to get to. So then looking at from the specification goal, so I'm taking back, back to the problems with salt to spec, so we'll look at them as a collection of independent capabilities, so a better way that they can be adopted independently without having to have all of uh, one big spec defined. Um, 
then we can say, well, there might be interesting groupings of these capabilities, and then we'll we'll label them as a profile, um, and then maybe multiple domains can just say, well, I'm this domain vocabulary plus uh, some uh, core profile, uh, and that might be enough. And each one of these capabilities, in order to do this, should define their own discoverability, so there shouldn't be yet a another spec somewhere that you have to depend on and insert what your discoverability is, but to have this be independent as well, but sit inside of a common framework. Um, the the formula here, maybe it's uh, not um, as clear with the domain X vocabulary plus resource definition means, but meaning that we have a set of uh, vocabulary terms that are intended to be reused across multiple domains. Resource definitions are those that says, here's what a requirement looks like, here's what the expected properties are, you know, what you would expect um, and need for creating one of these requirements, et cetera. Of course, we want to make sure we tie everything back to uh, the, this, the integration scenario at hand. So, uh, and sh you know, what can we do to better align as we end up with a spec saying, well, how did we end up with this and how is it really supporting this use case? Uh, so here's my attempt to say a similar thing in a picture, um, whether um, it works or not. I think uh, some of my lines are missing. Um, the, you have these common set of specs that occur um, in documents. There's, there's some, maybe some profile of Core 3.0 that's, that's created. There's the W3C link data platform. And there's these domain uh, vocabularies, maybe some protocol that exists within them, but they really just are uh, plug into a common Core 3.0 framework as opposed to um, needing a, a, a to be based directly off of it or to sit alongside of it. So what do I kind of mean by that? So uh, if you look at this package diagram sample in the, in the future, you can see you know, W3C Link Data Platform has some of the core version 2 concepts built into it, resource container, paging, ordering. Core 3.0 might have to take some of these concepts. Maybe some of these are tagged as W3C as maybe we can target them for standardization in the future. Um, you can see that the, the change management 3.0 in the middle has some some resource definitions and some semantics to find out how those are used around the change requests, some state transition and attachments, and then um, uh, and, and the, the intent is showing well that at, at the minimal it will depend on the link data platform to to exist, and you can get some additional value at out of um, in some scenarios by adopting some of the core three O concepts such as query. Um, and some additional discovery mechanism then, but the intent is that that, that dependency on all those concepts is, is um, a, a needed and incremental only when those scenarios are, are valuable. So you can start getting uh, value from what we're doing in OSLC from the vocabulary definitions plugging into a broader framework uh, without any other special knowledge. And uh, looking at what those core, those common components are, core capabilities of Core 3, um, and I pulled this out of the current Core 3 uh, spec uh, part of it, that is uh, really looking at just a list of sections. So it's, it's going to um, be an, an evolving set of, of um, compatible extensions or key concepts needed to support. Um, the, the various scenarios that are out there, um, but it's a way that to try to move forward into this uh, ability additive or, or independent way that these capabilities can be adopted. Uh, so I wasn't going to go through them in much detail, but more of just to to express um, how the approach and the model by which the version three specification uh, of core will will be uh, developed and evolved. So with that, I see uh, I have about five minutes left. Um, I'm at the end of my material, and I believe everyone has been muted. So if there's any questions, it's star uh, six to come off, and I don't know if there's any that have been queued up at all. Hi, Steve. Yeah, we have not had any questions in the chat. Okay. 
give people a chance to come off mute. There's my contact information. Feel free to, as you uh, sleep on it and come up with a question um, or reach out to me later. Um, that's fine, too. Well, I won't, I won't force this. I won't, won't uh, assume to speak for everyone, but for me at least, I, I think that was a, a well-done presentation, Steve. Well, thank you, and I thank you, everyone, for your time, for, for listening to me uh, ramble on. I think there's a lot of exciting good work going on in 2013. Um, we still have a lot of uh, interesting good work to do, and uh, stay tuned for updates.